Good morning and um, good afternoon to all. A very warm welcome. My name is Mansu Njai. I'm the head of inclusive growth at uh, UNDP. It is my pleasure to moderate this session on social and human development in the African LDCs, reducing inequality and advancing well being and opportunity, organized in collaboration with our UN sister agencies. Ministers, um, colleagues, participants, all protocol observed. This meeting comes at a pivotal moment, a time of unprecedented challenges. You would agree with me that the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to reverse two decades of steady progress on poverty reduction as amplified pre-existing vulnerability and also exposed fault lines, such as inequality, which is growing, informal employment. In Africa, we have a total of 86% of informal employment, that's uh, uh, the share of total employment. Lack of social protection, 80% of the population does not have any coverage. Climate change, which is likely also to have an adverse impact on the incomes of the bottom 40%. Issues also related to fiscal space, that sustainability. Digital divide and others that are disproportionately affecting women. And we do know that social norms are also playing an important barrier to women's economic empowerment and equality. All of this is undermining the realization of the SDGs. What we have seen recently is that global human development is on course to decline for the first time since 1990. Similarly, poverty is rising for the first time in 20 years. And a recent analysis um, done by UNDP found that up to a billion people could be living in extreme poverty by 2030. Latest estimates also point to over 300 million people in African LDCs that today live in extreme poverty. That is 43%, which is above the average in Sub-Saharan Africa. But even worse, if we measure poverty from a multidimensional poverty, uh, you know, uh, perspective, the proportion of poor then stands at the staggering 63% in African LDCs, which is the highest among all regions. All of this tells us that this is, there is an urgent need for bold, collective and coordinated action, not only by individual countries, but also by the international community in solidarity to correct course and build forward better with the SDGs in sight. Against this background, with its challenges, but also its opportunities. This session will present and discuss lessons, strategies, policies emerging across Africa and beyond to explore how progress towards human development can be accelerated African LDCs in the post COVID era. But let's not also forget that our deliberations will inform, will help shape the program of action for the LDCs for the next decade that will be adopted in early 22. To do so, we have today a panel of distinguished speakers. And um, in order, we will have the Honorable Dr. Patricia Kaliati, the Minister of Gender, Community Development and Social Welfare of Malawi. Honorable Minister, a warm welcome to you. We also have um, Her Excellency Ms. Paula Ingabire, the Minister of Information and Communication Technology of Rwanda. Welcome to you, Minister. We'll also have Mr. His Excellency Mr. Alexander Shitebe, the Minister of National Development and Planning of Zambia. Welcome, Minister Shitebe. Dr. Raymond Gilpin, who is the Chief of Strategy Analysis and Research Team with UNDP Africa. Welcome, Raymond. Dr. Joel Anani, 
Regional Director for Africa, International Federation of Medical Students Association, IM, IFMSA. And last but not the least, we also have Professor Arun Burat, the Director of Development Policy Research Unit, the University of Cape Town in South Africa. In order to help the meeting run as smoothly as possible in this virtual format, we just have a few housekeeping rules. Each speaker will be allocated seven minutes to deliver his remarks and presentation. And we really ask you to keep to the time allocated because there are sessions right after ours. Second, if you are a speaker in this session, please keep your video on and your microphone muted while you are not speaking. If you are not a speaker in this session, please keep both your microphone and your video off. Can you also note that we'll have French, English, and Portuguese interpretation available? Uh, the world shape button in the Zoom controlling panel at the bottom will allow you to toggle you know, between those uh, languages. And finally, um, for the last part of this um, session, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, that will um, give the opportunity to the floor, to the audience to, um, you know, to, to share uh, questions and, and perspectives. And for that, uh, we'll ask you to please um, register your questions in the Q&A box and also raise your hand if you'd like to. Without further ado, let me uh, first to our, turn to our first speaker, uh, Honorable Minister Kaliati. As you know, um, African governments have made significant efforts to curb poverty and inequality. Yet these twin issues remain sticky. So my question to you is, what experience can you share about Malawi's interventions to reduce poverty and inequality, especially gender inequality, and furthering human development. The floor is yours. You have seven minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, the moderator, and the, all my seniors present. Uh, in special, I've uh, mentioned His uh, Excellency, uh, the Minister of uh, Rwanda, the Minister of uh, Zambia, the st Chief Strategic Analysis of, uh, uh, for UNDP Africa. The Mr. Anani, also the Regional Director for Africa International Federation of uh, Medical Students Association. Uh, Mr. Horat, Director of Development Policy and Research Unit, University of Cape Town. And government officials and those listening on the Zoom, on behalf of Malawi government and on behalf of His Excellency, the State President of the Lhasa Sekwele, the one who opened uh, this session, and on my own behalf, I would like to thank you and thank the United Nations for making Malawi to host this uh, Africa Region Review Meeting. Indeed, I'm really honored to speak on this topic, social and human development in the Africa, at least development countries reducing inequality and also advocating, advancing well-being and opportunities. A number of factors contributing to the high prevalence uh, of poverty and inequality in least developing countries, i.e. Malawi. We have uh, floods as well as uh, drought due to climate change resulting to low agricultural production and increased flood, uh, uh, food prices and also food insecurity. High level of gender-based viruses which we have in Malawi and also globally, um, we have 34% of women who are either physically or sexually abused. And 42% girls uh, are married before age 18 of uh, this day affecting their productivity. Further, the GBV is also the gender-based violence of presenting economic growth by diverting resources from their optional use as well as uh, the, the are spent on go goods as well as services related to gender-based violence. We have the civil strife and also political instability, such as the conflict between political parties leading to lost life, loss enabling environment for businesses. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and Mr. Mr. Mosio, uh, we have also the rapid uh, abnormalization that create uh, slum conditions with limited access to essential services such as water, sanitation, uh, waste management, and electricity making an uh, urban dwellers increasingly unavailable 
uh, increasingly vulnerable, vulnerable to uh, viruses and talk of such as uh, uh, pandemics. We have variables energy availability and also uh, price negatively affecting small and, 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 and medium enterprises, uh, thereby lowering their contribution to social and economic development for the country. The COVID-19, which has hit us so hard, has affected development gains in least development countries. The pandemic has made things harder for women and girls in Malawi uh, from loss of jobs, failed businesses, high rate of uh, school dropouts, and also teen pregnancies to increased gender-based violence, particularly rape and defilement. There are multiple factors that limit uh, least development countries' poverty eradication if efforts. Uh, for instance, the, in Malawi, the factors include the unlimited, uh, limited access to financial uh, resources, particularly by women and the youth, who comprise the biggest uh, population in the country, thereby limiting their participation in the development agenda. Inadequate support to women farmers and entrepreneurs Women have limited access to markets as a result of transport costs and cultural norms that restrict women's travel outside their communities. Limited access to processing of value-added uh, technology resulting in most agriculture production uh, from women farmers being as low as value as, and, and also quality. Your Excellencies and all my seniors, we have underdeveloped rural infrastructure. This challenges is a major constraint on agriculture and small scale and medium enterprises as it affects the cost and also continuity of production and the quality of products. A failure is by to make international aid a catalyst for development by not utilizing it to develop financial services for the poor, improving infrastructure, in, in, uh, implementation of land reform, building mechanisms, and also small and medium enterprises to create a diversity and also modern rural sector. And lack of limited understanding by macro, uh, retro donor institution in the actual causes of poverty and how those causes, causes have been and can be effectively addressed. The moderator and all my seniors, I'd like to conclude my, my remarks by highlighting how to accelerate progress towards human development through addressing aspects contributing to poverty and inadequate in the African least development countries. And this include addressing lack of population growth and high fertility through provision of sexual and reproduction health services, promoting female education and also women economic empowerment. For example, the Malawi government is uh, constructing more boarding secondary schools in increasing female enrollment. On addressing gender-based violences, it is critical to implement prevention strategies to reduce cost of services, supporting services, and on engaging men as, as, as change agencies and also perpetrators such as engaging men on ending all forms of gender-based violences and harmful practices and awareness on available roles. Malawi government has developed a strategy champion in the elimination of form, uh, all forms of discrimination and also violence against women and girls at workplace, at home, in, country, in communities, and in all spheres of life. Addressing gender inequalities due to poor educational attainment, lack of infrastructure, limited access to inform information and communication technology in this era of COVID-19, energy and transportation services, government need to implement innovative and, and sustainable policies and programs. For example, policies and program of Malawi has launched a digital platform available for web and also mobile services or devices as a, an app called 50 million African women speak. To improve women entrepreneurs access to local and international markets, Malawi is also empowering women in business cooperatives, loan and also savings programs and implementing early childhood development programs. We are focusing very much on the early child development as to make a, 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 a quality education and also to make sure that women, uh, girls and boys live longer in schools before they turn uh, age, uh, marriage age. 
But what we are looking forward as a Minister of Gender, making sure that even if they meet, they reach a marriage age, but we want to see that all girls and boys that in, in tertiary education at the marriage age so that they can make the rightful decision and when to marry and who to date. And also assisting the government and the president in developing this nation in one way or another when they live longer in schools. This is a critical, this is critical now that um, uh, traveling physically in, uh, is limited with the COVID-19 epidemic. And that's why we are saying we are very much focusing and constructing a number of hostels and with the COVID, with the COVID, with the climate change problems, we are also making sure that we are planting a lot of trees, which the Minister of uh, Water and Forest will be uh, tackling those issues uh, tomorrow. Uh, leveling the uh, food system both on and off the farm. The, in, in, the, this includes by raising, including uh, raising smallholder farmers and productivity, complementary public investment in agricultural research and also extension, irrigation, and also rural infrastructure. Inclusive value chain uh, development and also technology uh, flogging. Mitigating uh, flooding by having risk management solutions with the roads for both the private and public uh, sector and also incentivizing the public as also private sectors to act before the shocks and also conflict occurs. Addressing the poverty financing a gap by having effect as also public financing focused on the, on the poor, for instance, in line with the social protection for sustainable development strategy, uh, target one, bullet three of Malawi is implementing a number of uh, microfinance projects and also the social protection programs, for instance, the National Economic, Economic Empowerment Fund, which we are focusing very much on women as well as youth. This is empowering women and the youth to access entrepreneurship skills and also finances for businesses, ventures in rural as well as urban areas. The social protection program target 20% of the population and also has expanded the coverage of the social cash transfer program from the 28,000 household level in 2012 to 293,000 households in 2021. And in 2022, we'll be scaling also beyond this. This is aimed at improving health and nutrition as well as skills of uh, the poorest by, the, by building their human capacity uh, for improved livelihood. As government, under the leadership of His Excellency, the State President of the Lazar Second Government, the government, we are very much uh, focused on making sure that women and the youth are really taking part in the development of the nation by having a number of programs which some of them we've highlighted and some of them we are also, they are all on the ground. The ministers and all stakeholders, they are really busy making sure that women are participating in each and every program of government. I'm very much confident that poverty and inequality in the least development countries can be dealt with if aspects contributing to both are addressed. We'd like to thank you very much for honoring Malawi to be with us. And we promise that with the support from our donors and CSOs and, 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 and NGOs, and also with the support from a, a, a number of stakeholders, we are going to be there and we make sure that these programs are going to be addressed by donors being supporting the programs which will set aside for the women and youth of Malawi. The less privileged like the persons with disability, abinism, and also the elderly who are supposed to be taking part in all these programs. We'd like to thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you so, so much, um, Honorable Minister Kaliati. And uh, I think this was an excellent overview of Malawi's um, challenges, um, you know, the multidimensional challenges, but also how you focused on addressing the key drivers of poverty and inequality, including women's empowerment, including investing in the agricultural sector, but yet also dealing with the issue of fiscal space. And, and how to, uh, to, to increase funding, you know, to support the key programs like social protection that you mentioned. Thanks again, thanks so much. This was uh, very, very useful. Um, let me now turn to um, our uh, next speaker, uh, the Honorable Minister uh, Ingabire uh, from Rwanda. As you know, um, UNDP is supporting countries across the world to take advantage of the power of digital transformation. So Minister, my question to you is, um, from your perspective, uh, what, role can technology and digitalization play to support structural transformation and accelerate development? 
The floor is yours, Minister. You have seven minutes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ndi. Uh, honorable ministers, dear participants, greetings uh, from Kigali. And I'll jump straight into your question, DI. Uh, and uh, like you rightly said, UNDP has been a great partner when it comes to, uh, you know, helping us find innovative um, type of solutions to the challenges that we are, you know, facing or grappling with in our different jurisdictions. I think very specifically for Rwanda, uh, they've been, you know, a partner for many years. And uh, case in point, uh, recently, as we started, um, you know, uh, finding ways of how we deal with the pandemic and address it, um, they, you know, the, the support of UNDP came in very handy on how we can leverage emerging technologies to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so thanks to that partnership uh, today, uh, we are able to leverage the use of uh, robots in, in really supporting how our, friend, our frontline health workers uh, so most of these robots are placed in the COVID-19 treatment centers at the airport, they help with the, so we have two versions, uh, you know, the first uh, version was really focused on uh, how do we help uh, frontline health workers, you know, doing the routine work of, you know, measuring uh, vitals, uh, broadcasting messages in, in, you know, in places where uh, you have lots of people convening, and specifically at the airport where you have most people coming in in large numbers, and rather than having people line up to be tested, you have, um, you know, a robot with the capability to really scan hundreds of people and be able to identify anyone that needs further uh, examination. And so that has been very helpful. Not only does it reduce on the time, but also it allows our, you know, health workers to really focus uh, on the more strategic work of, you know, dealing uh, with, with our patients. And even more recently, we were able to, you know, benefit from uh, the same support to uh, have, um, you know, robots that were able to disinf that had the capability to disinfect uh, both small and, and large uh, spaces. Uh, and so the work that could ordinarily take, you know, close to six hours uh, is now coming down to about, you know, 30 minutes. And so, and this is really the role of technology, how, what are the kind of efficiencies uh, that, you know, technology is able to, uh, you know, to, to bring to life in these different aspects. But let me uh, respond very specifically to the question that you asked in DIA, which is really around the role of technology um, in, um, in, in, in supporting structural transformation. And, and, and this kind of transformation, we're looking all the way from whether it's uh, agriculture, manufacturing, service industry. And I think we have um, an underlying theme, which is, I, I mean, for technology, it's always going to be an enabler to all these key economic uh, sectors of any economy. And, uh, but also unlocking the opportunities um, and, and, and I'll go into details, opportunities around how we improve services, how we generate more productivity and efficiency, uh, how we become more transparent in our you know, service delivery, employment creation being um, you know, a key aspect of uh, how uh, technology can be best put to use. Access to information is the core of uh, you know, being able to leverage the capabilities around uh, technology, market access. But um, how do we, how, how can many of these things achieve, be achieved in a way that is going to reduce uh, some of the risks? And when we talk about risks, we're talking about risks um, and challenges of um, inequality, um, challenges of uh, you know, loss of jobs or limited jobs, job polarization, uh, challenges and risks around digital divide, uh, challenges around privacy and security in general that will come with even uh, the ability to use um, the different digital technologies. But the only way we're able to do that is how do we ensure that we are deploying, um, you know, digital infrastructure uh, that everyone is able to access, uh, access for all. I think the statistics are glaring in the sense that you have slightly above 50% of the global population today that is connected um, when we, to the internet, for example. And, and the biggest chunk of those that are not connected is on the African continent. So uh, if we're really, um, you know, thinking about the benefits that come with, you know, leveraging digital technologies, yet we still have a big, you know, size of our population on the continent that is still unconnected, then there's a missed opportunity there. 
Um, the other thing is even today we're talking about the Africa Free Trade uh, Continental Trade Agreement. Um, how do we foster digital trade and ensure market openness? How do we leverage international cooperation um, to contribute to how we can integrate our, our various markets? And so, and this is where uh, you know technology comes in handy to sort of play that enabling role, but provide also the platforms to do so. Um, but also, how do we make digital transformation uh, you know work for both the private sector and the government. So for, from a government, from a public sector perspective, you're talking about uh, service delivery first and foremost, that applies as well to the private sector. Although uh, when you're looking at private sector, you're also going to you know, think about concepts around um, e-commerce. And so I think unlocking that, whether it's um, the ability uh, for an SME to access a broader market that they would necessarily be able to, if, they, if it was a typical brick and mortar uh, type of business, uh, we talk about financial inclusion, that's really a key aspect that we're seeing uh, technology and local opportunities, especially in terms of bridging the inequalities that exist. And I think on the African continent, we're seeing very good examples of how the mobile technology has been a key driver uh, for financial inclusion, whether we're leveraging mobile money kind of uh, applications, the USSD technology, but really ensuring that most of the people on the continent that are unbanked are, you know, have access to some form of uh, financial services and products. Um, the other role that we see that technology is playing is really helping workers to, ad to, to adapt. I think when, when you look at, um, and, and the, the, the there have been many silver linings when you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think digital transformation is one of them. But how the, the kind of tools uh, that have been put to our disposal uh, in enabling our workers, both in the private sector, civil society, and government to continue to work for businesses to stay afloat, uh, is really is that's when you start to see many countries, many uh, you know firms being able to cash in on the digital investments that they've already uh, been able to make. Um, then, of course, the key thing that we also see is around skilling, uh, and I think this is a sh it's a shared challenge that we see across the continent. Uh, really ac uh, assessing the kind of the skills that are going to be needed. How are we empowering the workforce for the future? What you know, what kind of skills are we giving them? Um, today, we're talking about blended learning models because we know how heavily the education system has been uh, disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In many cases where you know some of our children across the continent may not even have access to learning through a radio and so how do we start to think about the necessary investments that we need to make going forward uh, in terms of blended learning approaches that will put us in a better position should we be should we be faced with a similar uh, kind of pandemic and of course finally I think one of the things we need to be looking at is really talking about privacy and security uh, and, and you know promoting trust and these are some of the risks that we have to continuously be able to mitigate as we deploy the different uh, technolo digital technology tools and platforms. And, and many of these are going to be addressed through, you know, a, a mix of policy and strategy instruments, regulations and support tools that we put in place to ensure that um, uh, much as technology is, uh, you know, is promising um, to really unlock uh, structural transformation, but in an accelerated manner, we can also look at some of the downside or the unintended consequences that would come with that and build in mitigation measures um, to, to address that. So in a nutshell, um, I think the, 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 this, especially at a time like this, when we are having such a conversation, it's very clear what the role of technology is going to be. We're going to have to skill our people even more. We're going to have to think about how we are leveraging these tools to achieve much more productivity and, and, and efficiency, uh, but at the same time, really thinking about uh, issues around security and privacy going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Ngabire. That was very um, insightful. And, and, and clearly, um, what came out from your uh, presentation is really um, the opportunity to leverage and harness uh, technology as an enabler, as an enabler for more efficiency, more productivity, um, as an enabler also to um, unlock opportunities. And I, and I see here, you know, the focus that you, you put on you know, uh, improved service delivery, access to, to the finance, the scaling bit, and, and really opening, I would say, forward looking solutions for structural transformation. I think that's really the key message here how we can harness technology in a forward looking way to really boost structural transformation. Thanks so much for your insights. Very, very useful. Um, let me now turn to uh, uh, the um, 
Honorable um, Minister uh, Alexander Shitebe, uh, to seek maybe perspective on, on the broader challenges here. Uh, and I'll have maybe two questions for uh, the Honorable Minister Shitebe. First, in your perspective, uh, what interventions are needed to accelerate transformation in African LDCs in general? In order really to reduce poverty, I would say even eradicate it, um, address inequality and further human development. And then uh, taking that as a, a, a broader question, how can Africa leverage its use as agents of change, its use in women to accelerate development and well-being and to harness the demographic dividend? Minister, I'll give you um, nine minutes since you have two questions, just to be fair. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Oh. Well, th th thank you so much uh, for allowing me the nine minutes. And should I uh, begin by uh, passing my greetings from here, Zambia, from the uh, lovely people of Zambia and to the excellencies, the ministers, and all the other people on the panel. Uh, I'm afraid my lighting isn't so good. So I'll try by all means to try and uh, get my point across uh, very quickly and uh, beat the nine minutes that have been allocated to. Uh, let me begin by thanking you for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very important uh, uh, Africa Regional Review meeting. I wish to begin by addressing the issue of policy and the problematic interventions needed to address poverty, hunger, and the low human capital transformation. I believe that was the first question, or am I, am I mistaken? I will want clarity on that one. Minister, you're correct. The first, the first question was about, um, you know, uh, interventions, that's a structural transformation uh, in LDCs and to reduce poverty, inequality and further human development. Uh, right, I, I will begin with a, a program level where we, what uh, Zambia is doing to try and get away from this uh, 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 coach that has really held uh, a lot of countries by the neck. Uh, let me begin by saying that in Zambia, we have put up programs uh, that are very similar to other countries, but that have been done at a very heightened uh, level and at a very, very good speed. For example, uh, to help our farmers, we have introduced what we call FISIP, that's farmer input support programs, where we help vulnerable farmers to make sure that they can graduate from being small citizen farmers into a middle class and then go into the commercial and large scale production of mostly our staple food, which is, uh, is made. We've also introduced what we are calling food security packs. These are given to vulnerable families where they, they, they are lacking to make sure that we, we make sure that no one is left behind in making sure that we continue with our development agenda and making sure that we like eradicate the, the poverty that is very prevalent in our in our African countries and in Zambia in, in, in particular. We have improved on statistics from rural to urban poverty. We have moved some basis points, but that is not enough. We still need to, to do more. That's why we've also introduced what we call the social cash transfer, just like in the case of Malawi. Uh, but we have scaled this up. We started with the eight districts in 2016, and we have moved now to all the 116 districts in the country. We have increased the number of households that are benefiting from the social cash transfer. And this is what is helping us uh, in, in terms of uh, programs to make sure that we can intervene and move away from being uh, 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 in the least developed uh, uh, countries. There is also the first uh, 1,000 days uh, concept or program that we are applying to make sure that within the first 1,000 days from birth, we upheld the nutrition factor. We make sure that these people have provisions and that they've got uh, what they need to, to stand that 1,000 1, days. We are also scaling up uh, uh, nutrition, which is a program that uh, uh, has been introduced into the, into the country to make sure that all the nutritional needs are improved, not only with uh, high value foods, but also with foods that can be, you know, cultivated by the people themselves, but have got nutritional content 
that they can get from all other foods except for all these expensive foods that they can they can uh, they can get. Uh, let me also uh, mention that at the national level, the schedule of poverty, the hunger, has been a recurring development concern, and as such, a central theme for national development plans in Zambia, where we have made sure that we have integrated data specifically for development purposes in our national development plans and in our economic recovery plans so that we can make sure that we leave no one behind. We also spend less for more to make sure that we try and get interventions to alleviate poverty, hunger, and uh, low human uh, capital formation. Let me again now begin to address the issue, the second question. To share on the ramifications of uh, the issue of African leveraging its uh, significant useful and female population to accelerate sustainable development in the region, including harnessing the demographic dividend, I would like to begin by stating that all of us have to appreciate that our population is one of our greatest assets as Africans world over. Uh, with the 2030 projected population growth rate, there will be nearly 60 million more children aged between zero and nine almost 110 million young uh, people aged between 10 and 24, and 96 million more women of reproductive uh, age. I am certain that the population age uh, structure in many countries and in Zambia mirrors that of many, many other LCDs with 79.9% uh, of this population being below 35 years, while 46% below 15 years, uh, uh, 15 years, my government has increasingly paid attention to the benefits of harnessing the demographic dividend in 2015, Zambia undertook the demographic dividend study to assess its economic and human development potential. Recommendations from the study have been adopted in the seventh national development plan, like I said earlier, and I am certain that the eighth national development plan, which is being couched now, will equally benefit from the demographic dividend uh, operation plan which was put with key objective is to provide strategic direction on harnessing the demographic dividends. And additionally, Zambia has launched its 2019 national population policy, which focuses on the integrating population of dynamics into all developmental planning, financing, implementation, monitoring, and accounting processes. We believe that this will enable Zambia to monitor critical interventions required to harness the democratic uh, demographic dividend. Moderator, informed by these uh, reflections, allow me to put forward some very basic recommendation or what we need as a country, as Africa, as least developed countries to make sure that we can harness the youth, harness the women. We have got deliberate policies in Zambia, for example, we access a facility with the World Bank where we brought in what we call the jewel, uh, uh, the, jewel, uh, the jewel program, where we deliberately want to put women first so that the women and the children and those that dro dropped out because of early pregnancies or early marriages are going back into school and they are finishing their school so that we can also harness their, their potential. We have made various interventions in skills training to make sure that the youth does not only get empowered through education to become that doctor that you want or the accountant, but they can have skill. And that's the survival skill that they can do bricklaying, they can go and, 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 and do welding and all other issues to make sure that that skill also and that uh, youth population is harnessed and brought up together. We're also appealing to our cooperating partners and those other social players to make sure that they can come together to build capacity into this very, very important uh, population group so that we can harness that potential and make sure that it works for the development of, uh, of the country. Uh, moderator, I hope I haven't taken too much of the nine minutes. 
and I hope to end here, and thank you. Thank you so much, Honourable Minister Chitembe. You've been right on time, so no, you didn't, um, um, you know, take too much time, and this was very, very useful, and I, I really uh, appreciated the fact that you uh, focused on investing in a sector where a large part of the African population, you know, depend um, for its living, which is agriculture, to really invest in agriculture, but also to make sure that we address you know, the uh, the needs of the youth by investing, you know, in deliberately in policies that provide more access to opportunities, to resources, but also to skills to really, you know, empower the youth to become, uh, you know, fully agents of change. Thanks so much, Minister, for, for your insights. Let me uh, now um, turn to, um, to my UNDP colleague, maybe to chime in also on the same kind of challenges, but from a development agency's perspective. Uh, here, Raymond, um, what would be your take on, you know, the key interventions um, that are needed to accelerate transformation in African LDCs uh, in order to reduce poverty, inequality, and, and really uh, foster human development? Raymond, the floor is yours. Um, you have um, seven. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mansu. And... Um... I'm really pleased to be here, to be part of such an illustrious panel. It's been very um, informative and also encouraging to hear um, African leaders and the ministers here present speak to such important issues with both passion and focus. Um, because Africa's development challenges um, have endured for quite a while. Um, COVID has been a major disruptor, and we now stand at a point where we could look back and uh, see what lessons that we could learn and look forward to see how we could address these. Um, we've been at points like this in various uh, stages in our history, but I think this one is different uh, because COVID has not only led to reversed development, as you rightly um, alluded, Mansu, but it has also reshaped the way we think, the way we work, and the way our economies um, 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 operate. Um, uh, before COVID, um, a lot of African countries were making the necessary investments, et cetera, um, and also policy um, changes, but you know, COVID um, could push as many as 43 million Africans back into extreme poverty. Um, because of COVID, 100 million Africans who were able to afford sustainable energy could no longer do so. Because of COVID, 168 million Africans are now more food insecure than they were before. Um, because of COVID, some econo economies are going to contract. The challenge now becomes, how could we reimagine the future from both a policy and programmatic um, perspective? But inequalities lie at the core of this. Um, and there are three, uh, four main inequalities I want to highlight here. Um, access to justice, access to technology, access to finance, and access to social services. Um, without a focus on these four inequalities, We'll continue to see so many of our women left behind, so many African youth without any um, hope, and also so many uh, people who are geographically distant from major cities, not having the wherewithal to um, be productive. And so what could we do from a policy and programmatic um, perspective? I think um, from a policy and pro 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 programmatic perspective, there are four important things that we, we, we need to do. First is I think we need, to re, we, need, we need to think about how we integrate our solutions. Um, yes, individual programs and projects are great, but development in Africa post COVID is a complex challenge. And here what we want to have is the mindset of solving a complex challenge and not just answering specific questions. We can answer specific questions relating to technology, relating to agriculture, relating to um, non-formal sector, 
which is good, but it does not bring the synergistic approach to complement that, that highlights both complementarity and sequencing. And so Africa's development progress is no longer a la carte. We don't, we don't go, we shouldn't think about picking how to work with this donor or that institution, but it has to be both sequenced and complementary. The second thing that we need to focus on is um, structural economic transformation. African countries are the only, the only the, uh, the Africa is the only continent where for the majority of the countries, the structure of African economies is roughly the same as it was in 1960. Um, this explains why Africa is not as much of a player in, um, in the global economy and why, and why African economies um, struggle. Structural economic transformation does not mean just uh, move away from agriculture to um, um, uh, manufacturing or services. Structural economic transformation demands that we think through how we utilize all the resources that Africa has. It's human capital, it's mineral wealth, it's agricultural wealth, it's maritime economy. How do we put all of these together with technology, with a focus on inequality to um, work towards a different outcome? The third thing I think we um, need to do is re-engineer Africa's trading um, environment. Last year's um, World Development Report focused on global value chains. And um, one of the things that was mentioned was that if we have, um, if we have um, improvements in the way our value chains are managed, um, we could have a more direct um, uh, impact on GDP growth than trade. What does this mean? It means that we need to focus on value retention um, within the value chain um, 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 uh, productive capacity. So more of the value of what Africa, Africa produces remains on the continent. Um, in the agricultural sector, even in the uh, looking at the cell phone industry, less than 5% of the value of those industries remains on the African continent. We need to do that. And so value retention in trade is important. Value creation is also important, which is why within the context of the Africa continental free trade um, area arrangement, we have to um, ensure that we um, push forward, not just with uh, the fourth industrial revolution, but also with manufacturing. Um, we, we hear a lot about leapfrogging manufacturing and now doing services. But if you look at the import bill of African countries, manufacturing could help bring that down um, significantly and also be the kind of job creator that we want to see. And by expanding job opportunities, we are doing so with, do so with inequality in mind. So that we're ensuring that our youth, the women, those who are geographically distant in the rural areas can all participate. Um, so that's the um, third thing. A fourth thing I want to mention very quickly, and I'm running out of time, is African countries need to prioritize so social protection. And this means both contributory and non-contributory um, social um, protection. Because of COVID, we've seen a lot of countries doing cash transfers, revisiting social um, protection. But in a, a few of the countries, it is being um, uh, rolled out more as another form of aid or charity to people who are going through a difficult time. No, this should be viewed as a strategic investment in building human capacity, giving people a safety net and breathing space to be able to invest and thrive there and, in, and by so doing, be a lot more, um, be a lot more um, uh, economically. Um, so I've, I've said a lot about, um, I've said a lot about um, what we are doing, et cetera, what we uh, plan to do, et cetera. But what is UNDP doing? 
Um, just very quickly, um, in the, on the African continent last year, we talked about, we um, launched um, UNDP's strategic offer in Africa. And in this offer, which is on our website, we have espoused this synergistic approach to development, where we're not just focusing on what projects we can do, but we're focusing on how we can work with African countries to um, organize um, development um, progress around six impact areas, natural resource governance, structural tra economic transformation, women and youth employment, climate change and mitigation, ad and affordable, sustainable uh, energy and peace and security, which are underpinned by foundational enablers, which run everything from governance to digitization to cooperation and development intelligence. The point is that the six impact areas have at their core specific interventions that address the inequalities I mentioned in the beginning. Access to finance, access to justice, access to technology, and access to services. And this enables us to be able to make meaningful um, strides with economic, with social and human development, um, and also address both vertical and horizontal inequalities in African countries and societies. Um, without this, we cannot, we don't, I don't believe that from a programmatic and policy um, perspective, we will be able to accelerate um, towards building forward stronger, better, and more sustainably. Thank you very much, um, Mantu. I hand over to you. Thank, thank you so much, um, Raymond. This was very, very useful. And I would just summarize it maybe with three uh, key messages. I mean, the first is to protect more social protection, to empower more access to justice access to knowledge, access to finance, and then transform, but rethink transformation. Really have, you know, a um, better approach at not only creating, but retaining value. Thanks so much, uh, Raymond. Those, that, those were very, very useful insights. Um, let me uh, now give the, the floor um, to um, uh, Dr. Anani um, and just um, look at ways that we could um, best unleash the creative power of the youth to build forward better. So Dr. Anani, my question to you is, what are the key areas for a new program of action that you would see to secure a better future for the youth in African LDCs? Um, the floor is yours, you have seven minutes. Dr. Anani, you may be muted. I, uh, we cannot hear you. Can, can you hear me now, please? Now, now it works. Please go ahead, okay. thanks. Thank you very much. I was saying that Sub-Saharan Africa has recorded a remarkable economic performance in the first 15 years of the 21st century. It is accompanied by a perspective and modest decline of overall poverty. This economical growth is unfortunately accompanied by a frontlet inequality in the distribution of wealth on the continent. It was great new to know that the reduction of the poverty and inequality has become the overreaching objective of the Sustainable Development Goal 2013. Indeed, 40% of people in Africa live be below the extreme poverty. Countries are fighting over water. Livestock and population continue to be descended by famine. Why are we getting poorer and poorer when our states are officially experiencing economical growth. This is because growth often occurred in sectors characterized by low absorption of unskilled labor. Yet we hold all this key to significantly reduce inequality in our, in our society. For this, session, 
I have consulted colleagues from nearly 20 countries in Africa and came to the conclusion that action on three main axes could be decisive in the fight against poverty in Africa. And these three areas involve the youth. The first one is the internet access. For example, the peasant in his village can, who cannot sell his products, who only needs, may only need an internet connection to boost his visibility and make economical growth or ecological trade. The internet connection could change the life of the whole family of this child called Kofi that has 20 years old in his village. Indeed, a visibility on the internet and his life could change and he could later assert himself in the international scene. The internet connection is a tool of opportunity for youth. Assess the population, assess for the population, sorry, especially the non-urban population should be an upper, a priority in the fight to reduce socioeconomic uh, inequalities. The second area that we agreed on was the youth innovation capacity, the support for the youth innovation capacity. Incentive to innovation continue to increase all over the continent. We can cite some politicians like Obama or Kagame who do not hesitate to launch program to encourage youth people to innovate. Young people who innovate, we can see them everywhere, but which kind of support is reserved to them? Unfortunately, in order to grow, many of them resolve to leave the continent, causing a brain dam that is increasing the impoverishment of the continent. Supporting youth innovation is one of the key in the search for solution to reduce poverty and inequality. The last and the third one is the seek for endogenous solution and invest in local values. The current pandemic, the current health crisis of COVID-19 has put a facet of Africa that we do not necessarily know. Young people have taken initiative and proposed external extraordinary local solution to local problems. We have done, seen the development on the continent of, for example, artificial respiratories, something that we thought, we thought possible only with big industrial means. Digital solution to various problems have sprung all over the continent. In reality, all that was needed was all that was needed was an open mindedness and an initiative to rely on local solution. We rely, realize with this pandemic that we don't necessarily have to look outward to move forward. At the same time, the health crisis is showing us our limits in many areas and is sounding like an alarm on the need to invest in local value, in youth local values. Internet access, support for youth people capacity for innovation and search for endogenous solution and a foundation that will surely help us to make giant strides in the fight against poverty and socioeconomic inequalities. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so, so much, Dr. Anani, for those uh, great insights on the key enablers to, to empower youth. And I really um, know three strong messages that you shared with us. First being to address the digital divide. Uh, this is um, uh, an issue that has been 
also touched upon by a number of um, speakers uh, before you. Uh, second is to build innovation capacity, allow really to, to reap the potential of innovation and keep it, re retain it in the continent. And the third is really the, the um, to better value the bottom-up approach in terms of solutions and, and innovation. And I, and I like that. Thank, thanks again so much for all your insights. Very, very useful. Um, the floor is now to um, our last speaker, uh, Professor Borat. Uh, I will have um, a question uh, for you uh, on the in innovative enablers that can be used to achieve well-being, that can simultaneously address the issues of poverty, inequality, including the empowerment of women and girls and human capital in African LDCs. Uh, Professor Borat, the, the floor is yours uh, for seven minutes, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I guess I, I want to start out with the background statement, which is really that if you're thinking about poverty and inequality reduction in any society, um, it is ultimately almost as a second order outcome from economic growth, uh, a requirement that you need uh, incomes through the generation of employment. So ultimately, the generation of jobs, if you like, uh, is what is going to be your most sustainable long run path to a reduction in poverty and inequality. So if that's the, if that's the sort of background uh, frame and framework that you, uh, that you utilize, uh, it seems to me, at least in this context, that there are sort of four key things that we need to take care of, and I'll run through each of them within uh, the Sub-Saharan African context. The first is you've got to keep an eye on what's happening to, in terms of the future and in the long run, what's happening to your demographic uh, 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 projections and the demographic profile of your countries. Now, while, while the data is uh, heterogeneous across countries, in essence, what we find is that projections from, from the UN will indicate that by 2100, 37.5% of all individuals of working age will be African. Let me just repeat that, right? So currently, we, we, we have a, a, a population of working age that is African globally at about 10%. So 10% of all Africans globally of working age um, uh, constitute the world's workforce. That number is going to triple, more than triple to 37.5%. Why that's important, right? And I just want to hang that and I'll come back to it, is that is the scale of the jobs challenge, right? So think of this as, and the number, if I could just get it quickly, is 2.4 billion. So think of this as a ballpark figure for the growth projection for the region, for the continent to 2100. And, and while that is partly a, a population dynamic, populations grow, the key thing is that our share, right? of the global labor force in Sub-Saharan Africa is going to dramatically increase, which ultimately means a dramatic jobs requirement. I want to caution against the sort of tendency to make this a region-wide uh, statement. There's a lot of heterogeneity, right, in the population growth figures that you have. And in fact, um, the data shows that five countries account for more than half of this population growth or the working age growth. So recalibrate that, that means that five countries um, account for more than 50% of the jobs target for the region to 2100. And that's a really important statement and perhaps also a statement about where we need to concentrate our efforts uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of a country focus. So, th so then that gets to my second point, which is where do the jobs come from, right? Um, well, currently, right, we have a problem. We have a problem in terms of jobs that are going to generate sustainable livelihoods and, in fact, see increases in income um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. What do the data show? The data show that if you look at the share of the working poor, and I can explain that in the Q&A how you calculate it, but the share of the working poor in total employment in Sub-Saharan Africa was the highest of all the regions in the world, 37.3%. Now, that that why it's important um, in a relative context is that the youth unemployment rate in Sub-Saharan Africa is actually one of the lowest of all the regions, right, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we don't have a problem in a relative scale 
of youth unemployment as much as we have a problem of the working poor. So we have individuals, if, if you like, in, in ILO speak, in bad jobs. The Lewis model, colleagues, and um, uh, my dear friend Raymond Gilpin has picked up on this. You can see the two economists on the panel um, about structural transformation. The, the Lewis model where individuals move from agriculture, sustainable, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, livelihood type jobs, uh, work, livelihood work into wage jobs, that Lewis model is broken currently in Sub-Saharan Africa. So as a consequence, not only do we have the highest share of the working poor in the, in the world as a share of the total employed, we have the lowest share of the employed who are in wage employment. Only 23% of the African employed are in wage employment. So individuals in the Lewis model sense don't have a wage job to go to, right? And that is the, that is the point, and this is my, my third key point, which is how do you think about patterns of structural transformation? All of this, colleagues, appropriate patterns of structural transformation will lead to higher levels of wage employment, which will then be the trigger for a reduction in poverty and inequality. If you have patterns of structural transformation of a specific type, and I'll get to that, you, you will absorb a larger number of young people and women into, into wage employment. What do we mean by structural transformation? Well, the one, the one line answer is, the, is this famous Lewis model, right? The Caribbean economist who won the Nobel Prize is that economies in general on the long course of economic development will move from agriculture through to manufacturing into services. It's what, what is latterly called the Asian model of development, but in many ways, it's the only model of development we have in modern economic history, right? That puts manufacturing at the front and center of a industrialization process for an economy. I don't think that's the only route to industrialization. However, the counterfactual is, I, one would find it very difficult to find an economy moving to middle or high income country status without parts of manufacturing doing something, uh, being part of that story. The problem is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, most of the data shows that our manufacturing share of GDP has actually declined in some cases, and in almost all countries, it's flatlined. So you haven't seen a change in manufacturing share of GDP. That in, in one sense points and alludes to the breakdown of a process of structural transformation. We need to figure out a way to get those sectors in urban areas, those sectors that principally are manufacturing, but also services, uh, higher productivity services jobs, uh, energized and moving so that they are absorbing people from rural areas into into urban wage jobs. That's the key thing, right? Um, if, if, if that's not happening, because currently the pattern of structural transformation is of individuals moving from rural areas into low productivity services jobs, i.e. the informal sector. That's not a sustainable process of structural transformation. And it's certainly not a process that's going to um, that's going to sufficiently and effectively reduce poverty and inequality in a society. In the 30 seconds I have left, the one way to think about, about um, economic development is this notion of economic complexity and capabilities. That instead of focusing on a sector, manufacturing, or latching onto uh, fourth industrial revolution type sectors, figure out the capabilities that you currently have in an economy. It may be in chemicals, it may be in cocoa, it may be in wood products. Um, figure out those capabilities and go and develop cap uh, uh, expertise in products that are nearest to the existing product that you are exporting or have capabilities in. There's a deep literature on building economic complexity in a society. Uh, and I think that's a really important uh, point of departure for thinking about this as a form of structural transformation that ultimately can reduce poverty and inequality and at the same time, absorb young people and women into the labor market. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Burat. Very, very insightful, um, um, very strong messages that kind of uh, really um, forces us to, to rethink. And um, the messages are that first, um, we should have at the center of our policy agenda, 
issue of job creation. How do we go about it? And for that, um, rethinking, you know, structural transformation along the lines of what patterns make more sense given our endowments and what, what capacities uh, shall, shall we build? Not necessarily manufacturing, it's a possibility, but also look potentially into, you know, higher products, the higher value, you know, um, um, services, um, you know, and, and sectors as, a, as an alternate way of uh, looking into this. Um, thanks so much, um, very useful. I guess this will trigger uh, some, some conversations. Um, let me now um, uh, turn to uh, the last part of um, our session, which is the, uh, the question and answers from the floor. I understand we may have a question from uh, our colleagues from UN Women, is that confirmed? If not, I can move to um, the number a uh, couple of questions that we have uh, from the floor. And yes, 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 please. Yes, Mansur. Yes, please, please, yes. please. Uh, from uh, women. Please, Clara, please, not, please, yeah, please go you. ahead. Thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is um, Clara Nyangwe. I am the head of UN Women in Malawi. I just have a sh really short uh, contribution to make. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to, to add or to compliment um, what the Honorable Minister from Gender said. Um, actually, we all know uh, that the cost of gender inequality is very high. Studies have shown that gender gaps cost nations 15% of their GDPs. For LDCs, this is huge. And it is a major cause of underdevelopment with serious consequences of, on human development out, uh, outcomes. We've talked uh, a lot about um, agricultural development. I just want to make reference to a study that was uh, conducted by the World Bank, UN Women, UNEP, and UNDP. It was on the cost of gender gap in agricultural productivity. And it shows that if nations could close the gender gap in agricultural productivity, they could lift up to 238,000 persons out of poverty annually. This is what the study shows. And I just want to uh, take our minds to COVID-19. Schools were closed. Most of the schools in the urban areas went online. What about that little boy and that little girl in the village who's never seen a computer, no, no access to electricity? So rural transformation is really critical for LDCs if you want to improve on human uh, development outcomes. I want to end by saying that it is high time we interrogate macroeconomic policies. We interrogate them from a gender equality and a rights perspective. These policies must have a human face. For example, to achieve better human development outcomes, we must look at the impact of critical macroeconomic variables like debt management, taxation, interest rate fixing, unemployment, the impact of this on the most marginalized who are women, youth, and persons living in rural areas, especially persons with disability. Thank you and over. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for sticking to um, a very uh, brief um, uh, remark, set of remarks, uh, very much appreciated. And just wanted to, to confirm uh, what you were saying about the, the cost of, of, of the gender gap. Uh, I do recall that um, in UNDP, we had our 2016 Africa Human Development Report that actually estimated that around the $100 billion are lost due to gender gap every year, which, which is just huge. So, so definitely supportive of, 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 of your, your, your points. And, um, an, an opportunity here that um, that could be harnessed to really address the challenges we have uh, before us. Let me now maybe turn to um, our, our panel. I think uh, we have a um, um, couple of questions. I will start uh, maybe with um, uh, Minister Ingabire. Uh, we have a question uh, from the floor for you. And um, the question is that in an effort um, uh, to widen the, the revenue tax base. Um, some LDCs on the continent are targeting imposing tax on, on data bundle. I guess this relates to, to mobile, mobile phones and, and so on and so forth. And what is your take on that? Is, is that the right way to, um, you know, to approach this, uh, this issue? What potential impact can we have 
you know, on the development of, of, of infrastructure and technology. Uh, the second question that I have here is um, that um, we, um, what kind of financial support opportunities are there for LDCs to reach and harness the demographic dividend? Maybe here um, I may turn to, um, you know, um, uh, our colleagues um, from um, the, um, let me just come in, our colleagues from, um, not sure whether the Minister of Zambia is, is still around. That would be a good question for him. If Minister Shitame, you're still around, uh, would you kindly think of, you know, how best to, um, uh, to secure financial support uh, to harness the demographic dividend? And then from my own end, um, I will have maybe a follow-up question for uh, Professor Borat, who, and, and maybe also for Raymond to, to time on this. Um, as we are um, looking at how best to reset structural transformation, we also have this opportunity that may unlock, you know, uh, a lot of um, growth in terms of trade is properly addressed, which is the African, you know, continental free trade area. So my question is, is really what kind of um, specific entry points do you see? And here I'm referring to Professor Borat's uh, remarks saying that we may look into, um, you know, potential uh, high value or high service, you know, uh, sectors. What potential sectors do you see? And Raymond also, do you see any clear opportunity to better harness this uh, regional uh, integration, um, you know, uh, platform that's out there for us? Uh, over to you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Di. I think that the question that you asked was coming from Sarah, and I thank you. I thank her for that. But um, maybe just straight to the point. I think any uh, for any economy, any form of uh, digital tax that has to be imposed should also, uh, you know, not be done in isolation of what are some of those uh, support structures that need to be put in place. Uh, to sort of like um, fast track and, and, and drive adoption of uh, these uh, digital products and services. So especially when you're looking at uh, LDCs, I think there's so many challenges that one would be grappling with from, you know, a whole range from, you know, you still have lots, a big percentage of the population that still doesn't have uh, access to quality infrastructure. The digital literacy skills are still very low. Um, and so when you start to impose um, taxes too early in the game, uh, there's a danger around that. And the danger is that um, one, the citizens will always have alternatives that are not digital in nature. So let's take an example of services. Um, if you have a platform through which you're providing um, you know, digital services, and, and again, this is back to the notion that digital is supposed to come in, it has to be effective, productive, but it also has to be cheaper and faster. So if you are digitizing services and making them more expensive than they should be, because there's an aspect of that additional tax uh, uh, that has to be added, uh, that is being imposed on businesses, then the alternative is that everyone will, will prefer to go with some of those conventional traditional ways of actually accessing services. And so it's almost like you're shooting yourself in the foot because uh, the adoption is going to be significantly slowed. So timing is always important. And I think for many of the LDCs, uh, this may not even be the right time to start thinking about imposing any form of digital tax. And I say it because as we come out of the pandemic, as we look to technology and digital tools uh, to support economic recovery and shorten uh, our recovery process, but also help many of the businesses to stay afloat, if then you start to impose taxes, if then you start to impose regulations that make it less conducive uh, to go digital, then I think the, the, we're negating the efforts that are being put in place uh, to fast track uh, this digital transformation that we're looking for. So my take is, I think, uh, for many of the LDCs, it, it, the, the time is to think about what incentives need to be put in place. And once you know, the, the, you know, you've achieved uh, the scale of access and affordability, um, and you know, you've created uh, employment opportunities, and you know, you've uh, sort of figured out how the, what's the best mechanism of providing cost-effective products and services, then at that point, you can start to think, is any form of digital tax uh, going to support, uh, you know, be helpful? There's increasing the revenue best, but if you're going to increase the revenue best at, at the expense, 
of the other, you know, um, you know, transformation gains that you need to get. And I think that's where we need to, uh, as policymakers, uh, draw that balance. So it's 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 a very, um, you know, sensitive discussion. I see it happening across different economies, but timing is always critical in in terms of when do you impose uh, such forms of taxes. Thank you. Thank you so 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 much, uh, Minister. That was very useful, uh, Minister Shitemen. Any any views you would like to share? Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I can uh, share uh, just a little a little more on uh, how we can secure financial support for the, the more rapid dividend. Um, let me begin by restating the importance of harnessing this uh, sector of young people that are growing. Growing, uh, a lot of uh, growing importance uh, economically and uh, social and others uh, <clears throat> uh, economic areas. Uh, you see, if we don't do anything about uh, uh, this uh, group of uh, young and, uh, young people, of youth and uh, women, and, uh, we are going to lose a very important aspect of our development agenda. But to, to do this, it means that we have to find financing for them to go to school, uh, financing for them to get skills, financing for them to get uh, prepared to go into the market. Most of them will go there uneducated and unprepared without skill, and therefore it is going to affect the productive capacity of a country. I heard one of the speakers who was talking about debt, as in how many uh, less developed countries have gone into debt and it's got a lot of data to become unsustainable. But this is the only way most of these LCDs are going to finance their democratic, demographic dividends. This is how they're going to build schools. This is, a, uh, is the only way they're going to make sure that they get money to train the unskilled uh, uh, population. This is the only way that they're going to, 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 to get financing. There are other ways of getting financing, of course. You can have donor support. You have cooperating partners that will come to, to your aid to make sure that they can harness this. But this mostly, in a lot of these countries, is not enough. Therefore, we just need to find a balance on how we are going to finance this demographic dividend and make sure that it speaks to our development agenda and development activities and our priorities. Other than saying that we cannot go the date wave, we have to find a way we can mix the, 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 the cooperating partner in terms of, of donations and donor support and our own financing in terms of loans and our productive capacity, capacity as, uh, as countries in uh, sub-Sahara and in the rest of Africa. Uh, thank, thank you so much, um, uh, Minister Shiteme. Let me maybe turn now to uh, Professor Borat and then uh, Raymond. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much, Chair. So, so I guess the point I was trying to make is that um, the idea of, um, of going into those markets or developing export markets based on your existing capabilities is precisely why um, the notion of a picking or notion of picking a sector or picking a product is very country specific. Um, and so, if, so the idea is, and, and, and of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the idea is try and go to slightly higher value added products based on what you are doing already. Simple example, if you are planting and um, uh, uh, growing cocoa, right, go into chocolates, right? So the, the nearest product from cocoa would be chocolates. You have the capability, you have the raw material, then the idea is figure out what it is the capability gap is. Do you need skills? Do you need machinery? Um, is, is there transport infrastructure? And that's the role of industrial policy to figure out what those capability gaps are. Is it trade protocols that need to be signed? Once those are lined up in a very specific product based on the initial um, capability of the country, you then proceed on that basis. Um, the counterfactual is important. It means that if you're producing cocoa, don't try and start um, an aeronautical industry, right? Go where your capabilities are, and that's the sort of small steps to industrialization um, story. 
Thanks. Thank, thank you so, 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 so much, um, Professor Bora. That, that really clarifies and um, definitely um, fully understood that this is um, an exercise that each country should actually pursue to really look at, you know, where its competitive advantages, what potential gaps are there, and how to look, unlock the opportunity that are sitting there, but that may be low-hanging fruits, but are that not, unfortunately not maybe fully exploited. Uh, Raymond, any, 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 any views uh, on the uh, opportunities to, uh, to even better leverage the, um, the regional uh, integration platform, the Africa continental trade area? Um, you know, thank you so much, and thanks to all the other speakers. Uh, just want to add a, a, a little bit to what um, Professor Borat has just mentioned. Um, the question about um, how you decide where to focus in economic transformation has challenged us for the longest time. And um, in Africa as well, um, a lot of the traditional um, theoretical frameworks we have really, really don't apply. But there is um, some new data work that's being done by a Chilean economist uh, called Cesar Hidalgo. And it's something that he um, calls the uh, economic complexity question, where he uses big data to help to see what the competitive and comparative advantages are of various countries and sectors. The um, website, I think, is oec.world.com. And in that observatory of economic complexity, um, you could probably try to see some of the, um, um, uh, how you fit into some of the recommendations that Professor Borat has just um, mentioned. Okay, where do you go now? Over time, where will your economy be most competitive? What's your resource endowment? And I think those sorts of um, conversations we should be having um, before um, plunging into a lot of the um, costly and um, capital intensive um, issues. But while I have the floor, I just want to um, augment a little bit what the um, Honorable Minister from Rwanda um, shared as re regarding the fiscal side and, tax and, and taxation. Um, the reality is she is absolutely, she's, ab she, she's absolutely right. But the reality is that most Africans pay indirect taxation that far exceeds anything that um, the governments would tax them because of the number of non-tariff barriers that they have to face. And so in addition to what she just mentioned, um, yes, um, countries should be very judicious as they decide about when to, to apply a tax, but at the same time to look at the total picture. If you reduce some of the non-tariff um, barriers or challenges African, African consumers have to face, they'll probably be able to afford a tax that is much lower than what they are paying right now or they are losing because of, um, of um, uh, business governance um, issues. And so my point here is um, a more um, comprehensive package and let's not just look at taxation in isolation. Thank you, over to you, uh, Mansoor. Thank, thank, thank you so, so, so much, uh, Raymond. Um, let me maybe now turn to um, uh, uh, Minister um, um, Cariati um, and uh, also uh, uh, Dr. Anani for any final thoughts, um, you know, based on, on what the debate, the conversation that the debates have triggered, any messages that you would like to share? Um, Minister uh, Cagliati? Uh, thanks so much, Moderator, and all oh, my seniors. Uh, this is very important where you're engaging the, these developing countries to highlight a number of factors which are affecting the countries and also the people at large. I uh, would like to thank UNDP, but also the UN, uh, the UN through the Kuala Nyagwe, who is also supporting the programs of Malawi government and also the ministry. We are very much focusing that on the economic empowerment of women, engagement of the youth, the programs which are put in place, the uh, entrepreneurship skills, the uh, training programs which we put in place. As, as, as the what one of the minister of Rwanda said, this is to do with COVID and we focus very much on uh, uh, technology, which is so paramount in education. But also we are very much on the farmers, the smallholder farmers, how we are to empower them. As a government of Malawi, we are really putting a lot of measures to make sure that we, uh, the Malawian farmers, i.e. women, are so much engaged. 
we believe in that when being a, a minister of gender perspective that when empower women will also empower the nation and uh, we are going to meet all the 17 sustainable development under UN and also the uh, the uh, sustainable development goals on 2063 agenda which we are very much focusing on and we have our own also strategic plans as well as agenda 2063 as Malawi perspective all this we are looking forward to seeing that we work hand in hand with our partners our donors, and there you are, uh, that you are also supporting government programs. We'd like to thank you very much for honoring Malawi to host this program. Would, would, it, would, would have seen you in person, but because of the COVID, with the Minister of also here is making sure that we get rid of all these challenges and we are scaling down with the COVID, make sure that women and youth are moving forward, right, and doing business and helping his excellence and developing this nation in one way or another. We promise that we are going to be there and with the support which you are going to get from the UNTP, the programs which are there, from UN, from our uh, World Bank. We are focusing very much on also investing in early child development uh, so that when we uh, educate, uh, uh, we, we, we have our programs in the early child development, we are going to make sure that boys and girls live longer in schools and make a rightful decision in supporting programs of government. And also the, uh, the employment programs which you are putting in place as Malawi government that's focusing on the youth as well to make them busy. But with the COVID, we are scaling down. And shortly, we are going to meet face and face and see how best the donors are programming our, uh, the, the programs for the Minister of Gender, Minister of all the ministers whom we have, and also the programs for government. We'd like to thank you, the moderator. We'd like to thank you, uh, our, our, our UNDP Griffin. And also all those who have been listening to us, may God bless you and may God remember you in a special way when you are thinking about the least, uh, the least development countries so that we should be offered par with other countries uh, beyond. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Maybe just a um, um, quick uh, word from uh, Dr. Anani. I understand he has to, um, he has a small constraint. Any, any final words before we, we wrap up? Okay, thank you very much. I want to say that I was really glad to be part of this session, and I believe that conclusion of this session can help uh, our governments and also help organizations that are working on reducing poverty in Africa to look on what youth needs to, to show up, what our countries need to uh, to, to grow and reduce inequality of wealth distribution. And I will add uh, uh, to that, uh, in my federation, the federation that I'm working in, we have some training programs for youth to empower them, to train them to be the next leadership in their, in their community. And we are also working on advocacy on local and global level to empower this uh, youth because, as you know, and is always said that youth are the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you so 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 much, uh, colleagues. I think um, we have, unless there are any further questions, we have um, reached the um, final. Um, uh, stage of um, this conversation. I have a very last question, which is a bit more technical, um, which is, um, uh, can we, uh, should we focus on inequalities or more on inequity? So anybody who wants to share some perspectives on that. I think I was, I was actually waiting for the good professor to jump in and uh, rescue us, but uh, <laughs> um, I think that um, you do pose uh, quite a very important question because um, inequalities um, um, are a very broad concept. As I mentioned, um, they, took, they, they speak to a lot of the, um, the various types of differences um, between groups and um, some of which may be organic and others may be imposed. Um, inequities um, speak to, to my mind, to a more um, systematic uh, 
and um, regulatory type of um, outcome that leads to one group being in a better or more privileged position than another. And uh, when you think about inequity, so when it comes to uh, policy um, uh, focus, I think um, inequities are a lot easier to, um, um, to focus on than inequalities, which I think we'll always have in society. There'll always be differences um, because capacities are, are different. But maybe we should be. You do pose a, a great question. And I do look forward to um, Professor Borat's next book, which will be on um, inequities. Yeah, I mean, if I just quickly come, come in on that, I mean, think, think of equity as the policy response you require um, to resolve the problem of inequality. I mean, that's probably the simplest way to think about it. So, uh, so, so in the sense that we would like um, appropriate policies that lift individuals out of poverty, for example, through social protection, better health access and so on, and you equalize opportunities, right? So that's the state's role. That gives us the platform through which to think about resolving the inequality question, right? And I think um, that's probably the best way to think about that. Is there a choice between the two? I think both are really, really important. Um, I think it's foregrounded that we, as a society, certainly for my own country, income inequalities are the highest in the world. You cannot have a society that doesn't think about income inequality. At the same time, the reproduction of that income inequality comes from existing inequities across social services and elsewhere. And so, so it's both of those that are really, really important. I would argue that on a country basis, perhaps income inequalities in least developed countries, this is what we are focused on, income inequalities are probably less of a concern relative to the concentration of equity, right? So ensuring that we have um, high levels of equitable access to social services and so on. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Minister, yes, please come in. Yeah, just quickly to piggyback on what uh, um, Bohart was mentioning, I think it's not either or. Um, and, and even looking at how the question was framed, I think it's not a, and yes, inequalities are more exacerbated and a lot of the policies that you'll see being put in place are more focused on how do we bridge that gap. Uh, but I think uh, when, you, when you truly look at it, thinking about inclusion, you're talking about fairness and justice, I think it's still at the core of everything, of every policy that needs to be put in place uh, when it's coming in to address, uh, you know, aspects of inequality. So I think these are two things that go hand in hand and really uh, complementary, but one leads to the other. No, thank, thank you so much. I, I would really, uh, you know, agree with that because I think um, ultimately the question is about um, how do you be, build a, a strong, um, you know, social contract? where the citizens and the state actually, you know, can relate to each other. There is trust. So this, this you know, issue is not one or the other, definitely it's both. It's both governance issues. It's also social issues. It's all economic issues. It's really about opportunities. How do you empower each and every citizen and individual to have access to resources and opportunities? So, so definitely that, that would be the, the, the way forward. Colleagues, um, now comes the, the daunting phase of me having to provide a summary of everything that has been said, which of course is <laughs> not an easy task, but um, I've just jotted down, I would say maybe five, six ideas um, that, that kind of speaks to you know, a number of key issues that I've picked. And for me, um, what we're up to is about how best we reset. We need to think differently. We need to build forward better. Not looking for necessarily, you know, what happened in the past, that, that's finished, it's over, but really what can we learn? But really looking into future proof solutions that can really transform. And this transformation we've been discussing for so long and it's not happening. So I think now is the opportunity to maybe take a step back, rethink it, and really address it from a, you know, a different angle. And that different angle is first probably to invest in areas where value can be maximized. A number of areas have been discussed here. 
agriculture. Why? Because there are so many people, you know, working in the agriculture sector, depending on that. Industry slash manufacturing. Um, high value added services. I, I, I remember, for instance, in Mauritius, investing in precision mechanics, really something that, that, that can be of, of, of value. Um, also looking into, uh, you know, nature-based solutions, if needed from the grassroots, not necessarily from the bottom up, but really, you know, um, solutions that come from the people. They have good solutions, but we need to harvest those and really, you know, make good use of it. Investing in innovation, that's the value of, you know, really the currency of development now. Innovation, we need to really invest in that in capacity, in, in human capital. Uh, and, and also how best can we invest in harnessing our natural resources? How do we improve our natural resource management? So I would say that that would be the first point in terms of how do you better create and retain value? And here I'm picking back on, on, on what, what uh, Raymond was saying. Second is... The approach also has to be more comprehensive, more integrated. We should look at issues from a, uh, I would say, from a global perspective and not necessarily from a sectoral perspective. Here we're looking at how to develop solutions that create synergies across sectors, solutions that also come with a clear sequencing. What, what to do first in the short term, what to, to, to work on in the medium term and really prepare for the future. Third is also to um, invest in green and inclusive recovery. Inclusive because what we are up to here is exactly what we're saying. How do we make sure that growth trickle down? That the population actually benefits you know, from, 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 from growth. And I think that's an important part. And the second being you know, um, the green solutions. How do we make sure that we also leverage you know, um, um, solutions that are uh, friendly to the environment. And here what we are after is more efficiency, more productivity, and really unlocking opportunities that are sitting out there. Fourth is how do you make sure that you make digital the default? Because what, what, that's one key learning from the, this pandemic. Unless you have proper digital infrastructure that is cost efficient, that is accessible, you're probably losing out opportunities here. Fourth is the pattern of structural transformation, like you were saying. You know, we do not necessarily have to use the same route as what we've seen elsewhere. You know, um, this transfer. You know, this uh, I would say transfer of uh, you know uh, labor from the lower productivity to the higher that has necessarily to be manufacturing. But look into really the opportunities that are out there that, that are country specific. Really look into what would work best. What are the gaps and how to fill those gaps in terms of capacity, if needed, upskilling or reskilling, you know, in, in terms of how to better allocate uh, the human capital that is, um, that is available. Five, I would say, from what we have heard, the key challenge is how do we create jobs? Um, unless you create jobs and provide opportunities for more incomes, it will be extremely difficult to address both poverty and inequality. Social protection is important to protect, you know, in the short term, but then you need to graduate from that. At least the social assistance component, you need to graduate from that and move into uh, a more social insurance, you know, um, uh, component, which of course is warranted if and only if you have a job. And, and, and that I think is, is something that's really important. So we're thinking here of, you know, this Lewis model that you were saying, Professor Borat, how do we, actually move from, you know, the livelihoods type of job to a more wage, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, job. And, and, and lastly, I think it's more on the, the governance, the governance uh, for quality public services. Here we're discussing a range of services, including taxation and, and so on and so forth. So, so colleagues, I would say that's my takeaway, probably, a bit sketchy, <laughs> definitely not reflecting everything that we've discussed, but I really wanted to take this opportunity uh, to thank, um, you know, um, the panel, uh, really very great, good insights, very useful, and I trust that these uh, can be very useful to fit into, um, you know, the, the next uh, outcome document that will inform the program of action for the next decade. Um, very good insights and, and inputs from the audience, thank you so much.
Um, also, the interpreters, of course, without them, we don't we haven't have, have been able to to, to learn this um, this discussion. And and one thing that we may not forget is that we're using digital technologies to have this conversation, and it's working. <laughs> That's something we need to flag. This probably would have taken required us all of us to travel to Malawi. It, we didn't do it yet. We're having a proper conversation. It works. Doesn't mean that we don't want to go to Malawi. We we definitely take on the invite of of Minister Kaliati to go to Malawi, and we love to. Uh, but I think it's also great to recognize that we we can leverage, you know, um, you know, significant results just using uh, and harnessing technology. Um, also, uh, wanted to, of course, to to thank the audience, and um, you know, the colleagues that have been working hard all these weeks to make this even happen. So really a big thank to everyone. I'm really happy to have moderated this, this session and hope I paid justice to the good work that I've been put into it. And I um, really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much. And then thanks for, for, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.